the Great Ocean Road, where the forest meets the sea, is one of the most beautiful places in Australia. I think that's really special to have human beings experience parts of the earth that are still so raw and, you know, it's just a, a special place. It's a hundred years since we began this important work which has created this wonderful road but also lives as a living memorial to those who served and sacrificed during World War I. They were called diggers in the army because they wanted them to do digging when they came out. I think that's the pioneer spirit. How they stuck at it really, they never gave up. 100 years on, we need to think about the people that built that road. Australia's involvement in World War I was very significant. We had a population of just under 5 million people during that time and yet 400 plus 1,000 Australians joined up. Around 60,000 lost their lives. People suffered, people went through horrendous experiences and then returned to Australia and had to make their life. We're talking about a conflict that was so large in its scale that no community was left untouched. The conditions are hard to imagine. I keep thinking back to the mud of the Western Front. I keep thinking back to the flies of Gallipoli. Hell on Earth, and hell on Earth is a phrase that recurs throughout the accounts that soldiers have either written home or have subsequently reflected on. Dan Tui was 29 when he enlisted and he served for four years. He was born in the central Victorian town of Creswick. Uh, he was a carpenter. Dan's family shared his letters home with their local community in the Creswick newspaper. And we could actually go back and read some of the things he was, he was thinking, some of the things he was saying. He landed on Gallipoli on the original Anzac Day, lasted until 3.30 in the afternoon when he was shot in the arm, up near the shoulder with an explosive bullet. And he spent some time in hospital where they had several attempts to try to get the ends of the bullet out. He survived this and then went on with the 59th Battalion to Fromel, which was one of the largest and bloodiest battles that the Australians were involved in on the Western Front. And he was decorated for his, his actions. When he came back, he worked on the Great Ocean Road. When the war ended, it took months and months to return all of the service people back to Australia. And then when they got here, there would have been a celebration for those who had made it. But then you're dealing with, again, a group of people who've just come back from a war zone, the scale of which was unprecedented, the trauma of which was unparalleled at that time in history. I've had an interest in the Great Ocean Road and its development going back to the late 70s when um, we purchased a piece of land out on Big Hill and when we got a copy of the title, the original owner was the Great Ocean Road Land Trust, which was the organisation formed to raise money for the construction of the Great Ocean Road. The Country Roads Board had been talking about the construction of a Great Ocean Road since approximately 1912. Howard Hitchcock was a well-known businessman in Geelong. He was a mayor of Geelong in the early 1900s and he was the driving force behind the idea of an ocean road opening up southwest Victoria. His inspiration uh, was in fact a drive through the southwest of France he saw this winding row that gave views of the ocean and uh, he wrote back to a friend of his um, in Victoria saying, and you'll see where I got my inspiration. He wanted this winding road that followed the coast. 
number two card is a view of the lovely motor drive up the valley at the back of Menton. The mountains run right down to the water's edge. I thought you might be interested to know that it is here and along the north coast of Devonshire that inspired me with the great ocean road ideas. He saw the opportunity for a road to create more efficient transport in southwest Victoria, but he also saw the opportunity to provide employment for returned servicemen. And he put those two ideas together and created the Great Ocean Road Trust. In September of 1918, the first survey team commenced work on mapping the path for the Great Ocean Road. In September of 1919, we saw the establishment of the first workers' camp near St George River. On the 19th of September 1919, the Premier, Mr Lawson, fired the first charge to start the project. Picking something for tea, Dave. <laughs> you like these little uh, cherry ones? Love them. Yeah. So how long did you have in New Zealand? Good time? Yeah, great time. Especially my grandson, we we stayed in the same room together. He's 51 today. Yeah. Your grandson? Yeah. Well, how old are you today? Oh, I'm only a lad yet. Yeah? 96. There you go. Yeah. My name is Doug Sterling and I have lived in Lawn since 1922, when I was born. Been here all my life. I was a World War II veteran, uh, served four years in the armed forces uh, in the Southwest Pacific area. The guys working on the Great Ocean Road were very proud of their effort because they knew it was going to be regarded as a memorial to their diggers, their mates they left behind who didn't make it. It finished up being called the greatest, longest, biggest memorial in the world even bigger than the Yanks have got. The Great Ocean Road is an engineering feat of real significance. One common misconception is that the archway at Eastern View is the War Memorial. In fact, it is a memorial to Major McCormick, who was the chief engineer on the project. The Great Ocean Road is in fact a war memorial in honour of the servicemen that worked on this section of the road and the soldiers that served and died in World War I. I'll ask you to join me now in the next hymn. Memorials are an intrinsic part of the Australian cultural landscape. One of the reasons they're so important is that the bodies of the dead never made it home. The bodies were buried overseas. In a large proportion of cases, the bodies were never found. Families couldn't, couldn't get to them. War memorials were places where communities could come to grieve. It's important to me, personally, my dad went over and fought in the Second World War. I had a good friend who was killed on uh, Christmas Day in 1972, uh, and he comes back every Anzac Day for a visit. Um, and I just go home and think about him for a while. So it's very important. Spirituality is the blood that runs to our heart as Aboriginal people. We believe when our people leave country that they become a spirit and they visit us on country and they watch over country and we always respect that.
let us all come together, embrace each other, and gather in peace. The Wadarung people have lived in this area for thousands of years. What took place for the Wadarung people here on country is a story of devastation, a story of loss, of cultural ways, cultural traditions. We only had one bloodline that survived, settlement. The Great Ocean Road was quite exclusive to white returned soldiers. Aboriginal soldiers who did make it back were thrown back into the mission systems. They were denied all the opportunities that were afforded to their white comrades in that case, including employment opportunities. Um, soldier settlement uh, land plots were never extended to Aboriginal returned soldiers. Um, certainly in the case of my great-great-uncle William Reginald Rawlings, he got a military medal for bravery in France. He was killed in action. Had he returned, he would never have received those, those opportunities. He would have been thrown back into the mission system. Our generations have been here forever. And there's a satisfaction in knowing that. When I say my country, it is in the same way that I say, this is my daughter, this is my son. I don't own them, but they are mine. I belong to them, they belong to me. And it is in that tone that we say, this is our country, this is my country. For us, the narrative is, we are still here, and we're still contributing, and we're still part of this landscape. I came to Apollo Bay first when I was about two years old. Yes, I've seen a lot of change in that time. I hope my hair's all right, is it? <laughs> I grew up with having a candle to go to bed and then I was about 13 when the electric light came into Apollo Bay. That was an amazing event. I was with my grandmother then and they had a cement brick house and they had to have the plug up in the ceiling and so you pulled a cord to put your light on. So that was a lot of fun, really. Pull your cord, the light went on. Pull the cord, the light went off. <laughs> Before the roads, it took eight hours to get to forest and often very difficult trip up through the mud, especially during winter. Male passengers were expected to get out and walk up the hills seemed as if it was um, a godsend, really, to have the Great Ocean Road. Well, Lawn was a village when I was a boy. It had an industry around the place. Uh, saw milling, timber cutting generally, and also fishing. It functioned as a village because it had all the tradesmen. It had all the service people, like the Country Roads Board for the roads and telecom and... Uh, all those type of thing, and lots of families, big families, whereas uh, later on it became a tourist town. The most difficult part of the Great Ocean Road is the part from Eastern View to a place called Cape Patton, halfway between Lawn and Apollo Bay. This is terrain that is rugged, steep, dense bush, and cliffs that, that fell away to the ocean. And this was the section that the return servicemen built. They were called diggers in the army because they wanted them to do digging when they came out. When they started the road in most places, it was very, very steep country. And they had to lower themselves down the hill on ropes to find the surveyor's line pegs and then they'd dig a hole for their foot and try and stand up straight, and that was a big effort. Then they had to uh, dig between him and his mate, and his mate and so on, until they made a track they could walk along. They dug away the cliff face to create the road surface. They were doing that with pick and shovel. 
Very dangerous work, very dangerous work. Stones and things could be rolling down from above and they could slip and go over the edge and they'd go down you know, 100 feet or more. It was dangerous work. You shudder to think how different it is and the risks that the returned soldiers took to, to build the road um, you know, 100 years ago. Daily high-risk activity checklist for scaling. Was there any concerns yesterday that you had? You know, if we've got to do shorter time frames, just keep on top of that. A lot of the rock removal works that we do involves um, obviously a lot of safety harnesses and a lot of protocols in place to make sure that our workers are safe. And you look back at some of the photos of some of the men working high up on the cliff um, without any sort of harnesses, shifting some rocks and dirt with very steep drop-offs. Yeah, it does really show a contrast in working standards and safety standards, you know, between now and, and back then. I'm fortunate enough to live in the area. I live down at Torquay. That's what I look out of my window and I see every day. You, know, you just can't beat it. We're probably six or seven k's from Lawn. You know, it's a 10 minute drive for us. A hundred years ago, that would have been, you know, a three hour trip on a horse for someone getting injured or going to the hospital. Just the rain in winter, the heat in summer, the mud, it would have been terrible. It would have been no different to probably they would have had um, when they were fighting the war in World War I. Um, they didn't have bullets flying around, of course, but, you know, gee, it would have been horrific. people in charge found that the soldiers could not stand the, the use of explosives because it brought back too many memories and many of them were still suffering from shell shock. They just come out of the trenches and uh, uh, some of them used to get very upset when the blasting went on. In fact, at Hitchcock Memorial, which is around at uh, Mount Defiance, there's a gully just before you get to that. It's called Suicide Gully. And one bloke, uh, he badly shell-shocked, he'd had enough and he went over the edge, jumped over. But he was the only one we heard about that ever did anything like that. The return servicemen lived in camps. They were located along the Ocean Road, places like Grassy Creek, St George River, Cumberland River. Just watch yourself here. Where we're standing now, this land in through here would have been part of the camp. The camps were almost military style installations, uh, tents in very tidy rows. The soldiers that were employed on the project worked roughly 10 to 12 hours a day. They were long days for the workers. They were difficult days. Uh, they were well paid and they were well fed, um, but we've still got to remember these are returned servicemen uh, who've been living in very difficult conditions for some years. Now we don't talk a lot about our women who were in the camps with the men, but it must have been rather difficult to manage. They had to walk into lawn to get provisions and during the winter time, the mud was so thick that they'd have to tie newspaper around their legs from the top of their boots up to their knees, tightly with rope or string, whatever they had, so that they wouldn't lose their boots in the mud. Living in this camp, particularly in winter, would have been a, an uncomfortable experience. Uh, it would have been damp, it would have been constant mist, um, the winds would have blown through this area. Uh, it would have been a very uncomfortable place to be. Mrs Mercer I met because I had the privilege of nursing her in her uh, elderly years. And she was one of the war brides that came out after the First World War. She met Alf Mercer as a soldier over there and um, they fell in love and got married. He was one of the workers on the Great Ocean Road and he brought her to the tent city and she said even though it was only a tent, it was her castle because it was her own tent, which I thought was wonderful. 
Alf enlisted in 1915 at the age of 19 and he served on the Western Front. He and his wife Ada appear in the electoral rolls um, in 1931 as being resident in the Country Roads Board Camp in Lawn. But how they got together is actually quite a wonderful story. There's a handwritten letter from Ada. The letter's undated, but it's been stamped as received in February 1920. And Ada writes, Dear Sir, I'm writing to ask if you could give me any information of 2618 Alfred William Mercer. The reason why I would like to find him is that he's the father of my child. This is the kind of story that brings history to life. It's no longer just about dates and names and electoral rolls and lists. This is someone's actual handwriting and actual voice. She appears as arriving in Australia in 1921. But by herself, there's no record of any child with her. And I haven't been able to find any birth records as yet. The road to Lawn was officially opened in March of 1922. Lord Stradbroke, who was the governor, uh, cut a ribbon at a makeshift arch at Eastern View. Unfortunately, Howard Hitchcock died just prior to this section of the Great Ocean Road being opened. Following the cutting of the ribbon, there was a procession of cars that drove the road into Lawn. The first car uh, was empty apart from the driver, but on the rear seat was Howard Hitchcock's hat and cane as a way of honouring his part in the project. We know from records that there were at least 3,000 return servicemen worked on the road. We only have the names of about 400, unfortunately, and through misadventure, many records were lost. The names that we currently have were the result of a lot of hard work, particularly by the late Ian Grant from Portland. He made it his personal mission to try and compile as many names as he possibly could. Ian and I worked together to compile that list and to cross-check it. And um, Ian's passed away now, but his wife, Anne, passed over the records to the Lawn Historical Society. We're hoping that this sort of documentary might in fact trigger some memories. We've got the names of 400. Those names should be remembered and we should try and find as many others as we possibly can. Hello to you I could never figure out why you so hard to find It's an ongoing challenge to understand all the people that worked on the Great Ocean Road. Um, it's going to be probably a big uh, community effort to try and um, um, re-piece together these records. The Great Ocean Road was built by a mix of returned servicemen and civilians, and they're all worth remembering. So what we really want to get a sense of is who these young men were. What were their lives like? Where did they come from? What did they do before? Dan Toohey essentially served for the entire war. During a horrific bombardment, he got three other guys together and they went out of the trenches into no man's land and brought back 25 wounded men. For that act, he was awarded the Military Cross. From all these stories, we can get a sense of Dan Toohey as a very brave guy. But what comes through in his letters back for the front is this sense of luck. Well, this is interesting. Gordon Cross, who was actually killed during construction, we haven't come across that information before. It's a new name for us. Uh, we haven't got him. Gordon Cross's story is actually quite a sad one. He didn't serve, he was too young. Um, we first became aware of his story through an anecdote that Peter Spring came across. I started digging around and found out that there was a Gordon Cross involved in working on the Great Ocean Road during 1939 and he was unfortunately killed as part of a workplace accident. This appears to be new information, which makes this quite a discovery. Uh, actually, it was Marge Grant who reported this. Um, Marge says, 
Gordon Cross was killed one day after an explosion on the road. They thought they had put eight charges in the section and they went down below the road to protect themselves from the explosion. And they counted eight and then Gordon was first back up on the road to start clinging. But they put in nine charges and he was blown to bits. My father went and picked him up in a bag and brought him home in pieces. So that's a very sad story. Um, and he left a wife and, and one daughter, Sally. We'd like to get more names to add to that list, but as time goes on, it's becoming increasingly difficult. It's not like we're talking to the next generation about what their parent did or might have been involved in the Great Ocean Road. We're now three to four generations on. So that information is getting lost in history. It's a hundred years since people returned from the war and it's a hundred years since we began this important work which has created this wonderful road but also lives as a living memorial to those who served and sacrificed during World War I. So it really is an important thing to not just see this as a road that exists so people can go to beautiful parts of Victoria, but a representation of the sacrifice, the hard work and the dedication of soldiers who serve their country. The Great Ocean Road opened up this area for people to experience and to enjoy. There's not a day goes by that I don't think how lucky I am to live in this environment. I consider it a privilege. Great Ocean Road to me symbolises historical surfing, especially because of Bells Beach, but my entire career I've always come down here with that excitement to be surfing in this raw coastline. There's lots of energy in the ocean and, yeah, and just the history of it. I suppose the key message is welcome. We would say come into our country and visit the space. We know the stories. Come and sit with us, speak with us. You want to know this place. You want to know it have a relationship with it, come and have that relationship with us. You know, I'm continuing the legacy of our diggers. That's how I see my job role. So we want to leave a legacy of what we're doing here on the Great Ocean Road. We're very proud of what we got in the way of the Great Ocean Road. And we brag about it everywhere we go. It's a great achievement. Maybe somewhere in a drawer somewhere, someone will have a photograph or a name and we will expand our list of servicemen. I think we are at the beginning of the story, not the end.